room. <laughs> Hello everyone. Thank you so, so much for inviting me to come to Portugal. This is my first ever visit and I am coming back for sure. <laughs> Thank you. That means you're understanding me. I really, really appreciate you listening to my presentation in English. I'm sorry that I cannot speak in Portuguese, and I've really enjoyed this morning's presentations in, in Portuguese and learning from you, and thank you for having slides in English that has helped me. I'm presenting today with my PhD student who has just submitted her PhD. I'm very proud of her work, um, Kate Margotson. She and I are working together on translating the research that um, we've been doing for a long time. Kate was part of a study where we worked with Vietnamese English-speaking children in Australia. And I do not speak Portuguese, and I do not speak Vietnamese. I do speak English, and that is all. So you will very soon learn um, that I have a passion for supporting children who do not speak the language that the speech therapists speak. There are many children like that in our world that go from country to country. And we have very good tools in Portuguese, in Brazil, and here in Portugal. We have very good tools in English. But if a Portuguese child comes to Australia, we have maybe one speech therapist who speaks Portuguese, maybe, maybe two, maybe three. But that child probably goes to somebody like me who only speaks English. So our research is aimed to help people like me help that Portuguese child who decides to live in Australia. Hopefully you will learn from me. Okay, g'day from Australia. <laughs> I'm going to teach you the most important Australian word, g'day. g'day. Oh, perfect. <laughs> now you might be surprised to see a kangaroo, but we actually have kangaroos on my campus, outside of the library, outside of my office. We live in a rural country, side, part of Australia. So if you come, they are wild. So some days they are at the library, some days they are somewhere else, just like students. <laughs> <laughs> I have really enjoyed coming to Portugal. 
it feels a little bit like Australia, except for our history is with our First Nations people, um, the Aboriginal people, and so we can't always see it. Being in Portugal, I can see your history, but we have a very long um, history of living by the ocean as we are a very large island. When we begin, because Australia is a place that in the um, discovery era was discovered, although our First Nations people were already there. So every meeting, every conference, every presentation, we begin like this. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, the seas and the waters throughout Australia and pay our respects, and, and we've I've added today other countries, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And we learn so much from our elders, and we have begun to sit and listen and have our eyes opened. I have loved being in Portugal, so I know, hola, and obrigada. <laughs> That's it. But thank you so much for inviting me. It's just been wonderful to have the invitation. But thank you particularly to the researchers in Portugal who, before I even met you, I was reading your research and your research and quoting it before I even knew how wonderful you were. I was really honoured to work with some of my um, colleagues who used to be my PhD students to actually um, write this book chapter. Um, it is in English, sorry about that. But it contains a lot of the research from you here in Portugal and I have integrated it into the work that we are doing. I very often quote the work of you in different works, even when I'm not talking about Portuguese. I think that there's some excellent research that is undertaken in Portugal. Today, I'm going to be presenting some work that's been funded by our Australian government. And you might notice again up the top, oh, that's not working. Up here, um, we even have a kangaroo on our coat of arms. <laughs> Um, and an emu, and the reason is the emu is the very large bird like an ostrich, and neither the kangaroo nor the emu, they cannot go backwards. They can only go forwards, and that is why they're on our coat of arms. The Australian government has given us funding to do research um, to support children's speech and language, and um, here is Kate, who um, is doing the work with me, and also Helen at the moment. Uh, she is the person, for some of you, um, working on our Oxford Handbook. You will have heard from Helen. Um, I've got some grants and also from our, our um, team. The images that I'm using today are free. They're from Pixabay and Unsplash. Um, great resources, free. You can use them in anything and also my images that I have permission from the people to use them. Um, I'm not going to go through the abstract, but we are going to learn today a step-by-step -step process, how to think about when you suddenly have a child who speaks a language that you do not. What can you do? There are so many resources. So, this is the short version of the abstract. The aim of today's presentation is to support children and families who speak languages that are not spoken by their speech language pathologist or speech language therapist. So children like this one, who comes to us speaking a language that we think, oh, I don't know that language. That looks interesting. Aren't they really clever little children? And this is me going, Welcome! <laughs> I don't speak your language, but I want to learn and we will work together and see if you do need to come to speech therapy or if you are doing fine. 
And if you do need to come to speech therapy, what should we do to support your communication? Today we're going to um, talk in three areas. Um, we're going to talk about multilingual opportunities. We're going to uh, talk for the first time ever in the world. You are the first audience to talk about speech assessment of children's home languages. And then we're going to learn from Vietnamese children. Has anybody been to Vietnam? Isn't it great fun? Yes. <laughs> Who has been to Australia? Oh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> Everybody else, come on down. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, I want you to take out your phones or your iPads or your computers because at different times I will have a QR code that you can, and I want you to look at it while I'm talking, okay? So everybody get their phones, iPads, open it up, get it ready because there are a lot of free resources that I'm going to show you. And um, the editors of your journal, are they here today? I haven't, not sure if I met, have, anyway, the editors of your journal have asked me to write um, a letter to the editor, and I'm going to have some of the links in that that um, came from um, my keynote presentation last year that I did online while I was in Australia. We keep updating these resources, thanks to people like you who keep doing work and helping me. Um, so you are going to be the first people in the world to see some new resources today as well. OK, so let's begin. Let's begin by thinking about multilingual opportunities. Now, there are over 7,000 languages in the world. Do you speak all of them? <laughs> no. Hold up your finger for how many languages you speak. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a very broad definition of multilingualism, okay? Not narrow, but very broad. The ability to speak, sign, or understand more than one language, okay? So, Hold up your fingers for how many languages you speak, sign, or understand. Oh, four. Who's got more than four? Five. OK. Who's got two hands? Anybody got two hands up? We've got five. Five up there. Oh, you're all so clever. <laughs> Most people have three. Thank you so much for speaking English today. I really appreciate it. I don't need to tell you why um, Australia is a place that, um, sorry, I don't, I've just realised I don't think this is my very last version. It mustn't have copied across. Doesn't matter. That's fine. I just added some more beautiful pictures at the last minute. No content, but gorgeous pictures. Um, okay. So there are many, 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 many reasons why it is good to speak more than one language. When you grow up speaking English, when I was a child, even when I was doing my undergraduate to become a speech therapist, we were told that all children should only speak English if they had speech and language problems. They should not speak any other language. There are even speech therapists today in English-speaking countries that say it is bad to speak more than one language. Even children who are developing typically, who do not have DLD or speech sound disorder or autism, are told to speak English only. You can't imagine that living in Portugal, can you? It's just crazy. It's called a monolingual mindset. And so part of my passion is to support people in English-speaking countries to say, actually, 
people who speak more than one language are really clever. And there are so many reasons why it's very good. Doesn't it seem strange to you that I even have to say that? But that is how many people in many English countries think. Because you work hard to speak English, right? But I don't work hard to understand Portuguese or speak Portuguese. I'm lazy, and my colleagues are lazy. So, one thing that helps me realise that we cannot keep our monolingual mindset is this. Australia is a place people want to come and live. It's a lovely place, like Portugal. Sunshine, beaches, friendly people, happy place. We have the second highest proportion of foreign-born people of countries within the OECD. Almost 30% of our residents, of our current population, were born in other countries. And in, in cities like Sydney, almost half were born somewhere else. Our immigration used to be the way that the colonising happened. So it was the new discoveries, the new world. Australia was discovered by England, OK? So we used to have a lot of English people in Australia. And then World War II, we had people from Greece and from Italy. That's why we have very good coffee. And <laughs> Portugal as well. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of Portuguese people actually in Australia, but now it's changing to a more Asian um, population. In fact, have a look at our national census. So in 2011, no, I don't have a pointer, do I? Oh, there we go. Anyway, 2011, the top language was English, and then 1.6%, that was our next highest language. So it shows we don't have a dominant second language. It was Mandarin Chinese, then Italian, Arabic, Greek, and Cantonese. Five years later, the next top language was Mandarin, Arabic, oh, Vietnamese, hello Vietnamese. Cantonese, Italian, and Greek was gone. The next one, five years later, Mandarin, Arabic, Vietnamese is still there, Cantonese. Oh, Punjabi from India. Every five years, we have new top languages. Now, to be a top language means that you've got to have adults and children. So when you work with children, you have more and more and more new languages that are not in the census yet. So you have to be ready for whatever's coming. We looked at the census to find out and to change the monolingual mindset. My colleague, Helen Blake, this was part of her PhD, we found that when we looked at the census twice, um, we have almost 20, um, about 24, 25 million people in Australia, okay? And we wondered what was the impact of only speaking English or speaking other languages. And we looked at education, salary, and employment. We found two things. If you speak English very well and another language, or another five languages, like the gentleman at the back and the person at the front, you are more likely to have higher education, higher salary, and more likely to be employed than me. OK? So you are better than me in Australia. If you do not speak English well or at all, I am the one that has higher education, higher salary, and higher employment. We also looked at young children, um, samples of almost 5,000 children over time from when they were in preschool through school. And we found that if we looked at their outcomes 
in school, it did not matter if they spoke English or English plus other languages. If they arrived at school with no English, they just lived in a sea of English at school, so they become very good at English anyway. So the children were the same in language and literacy, mathematical thinking, and social emotional skills over time. It didn't matter how many languages they spoke. If you have a look at this, actually, it's a little bit hard to see. It's a paper that we wrote in 2016. What we did find was that if they had a speech and language problem, if they spoke one language or lots of languages, that's what mattered. That's what mattered. Uh, and that's what changed their language, their maths, and their social emotional skills. So, we now say every time I speak in Australia, I teach people to not have a monolingual mindset. It's so crazy. I have to keep saying it. Do not say only speak English. However, you live in Portugal, and I did some research about Portugal, and you have even more people in Portugal who speak Portuguese than I have people who speak English. So perhaps it's true that you do not say, only speak Portuguese. So hopefully today you will get some ideas about how to work with the child who speaks Mandarin Chinese because I saw that you have people, a number in your um, population, it says Chinese is um, a written language, and Mandarin or Cantonese, or there are many different Chinese languages. Um, so how can you work in two languages, in Chinese and in Portuguese, with that child that comes into your clinic? Has anybody done that before? Some of you probably have worked in, yeah, well, probably. You probably speak Chinese, do you? Do you speak Mandarin or Cantonese or something, or no? Yeah. Yeah. Xie <laughs> xie. Thank you. OK. My university helped me make a little movie that I'm going to show you. you that it's really important in Australia for us to know about other languages. But in fact, the United Nations has um, some data from 1990 to uh, 2020 looking at the exponential rise of international migrants, and particularly in Europe. Um, the number of international migrants has increased particularly in Europe and Asia, more than any other region. So watch this space. In fact, more than 40% of all international migrations worldwide in 2020 were born in Asia. The top five languages that moved around the world 
were from India, China, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the Philippines, and Afghanistan. And Asian cities look like this. Has anybody visited Asian cities around the world? Asian cities look like this, a bit like probably many of our cities in um, countries around the world. So we need to be ready to think, and this is why I'm giving you an example of an Asian language, so that perhaps it's a, a language that you might not know and you might need to think about because children will be coming to your clinics in Portugal uh, from different Asian countries as well as other lands around the world. So let's have a think about speech assessment of children's home languages. We're using this acronym like satchel. Now, I don't know if you know the term satchel. It's like a little case with a clip and it holds things together, almost like a handbag or um, so we have come, well, Kate came upon, Kate Muggerson came upon this term satchel as a way to think about gathering together equipment, things that you're going to need in order to do the work. So today is the first day we've actually used this with an international audience. Congratulations. And we're going to spend the rest of this year thinking about the satchel. So getting a lot of feedback. We actually have an ethics application in at the moment, and in the future we're going to ask people for feedback. But if you are happy to, if you think about things that you do and don't like, um, we have done as much thinking as we can, so now we're ready to get the brain's trust of the world to help us think about all the other things to make it so that the children of the world benefit. That's who we want to um, help out. The satchel has four parts. Preparation, collaboration, assessment, and analysis. So let's prepare, let's get ready. I don't know if any of you have heard um, my colleague Sarah Verdon speaking. She is an amazing speaker and very passionate about culturally responsive practice. She grew up in a small country town with 500 people. And now she travels the world She's absolutely remarkable. And she defines culturally responsive, a culturally responsive professional as somebody who's continually working towards competency. She doesn't like the term uh, culturally competent because it seems like there's an end to it. There's never an end. We're always striving and working. So a culturally competent professional is aware of your own culture. You're all surprised today to hear me talking about monolingual English speakers um, thinking that only speaking English is the thing you should do. So now you have added to your cultural knowledge just from <coughs> listening to me today. You've also learned how to say good day. So you've become a little bit more culturally responsive towards Australians. It's a willingness to actively listen and learn, to learn about cultures and perspectives and experiences of others, and to adapt to your practice accordingly. It's an acknowledgement that you don't know what you don't know. Sarah often talks about the fact that we are fish swimming in the water, and we don't even know we're swimming in water until we're taken out of the water. And it's really important for each of us to take ourselves out of our water to get an idea about what the world is like. If you have clients, children, families from other cultures coming along, find out about their food, their culture. I learned something amazing two days ago. I was looking for milk. You do not keep milk in your refrigerator. It's in a box on the shelf. I would not buy milk from a box on the shelf. I would only buy milk fresh from the cow in a refrigerator. I had to come to Lisbon to learn that. <laughs> so we're like a fish in water, aren't we? We have to take ourselves out of water to learn where to find milk. The man in the store, when I said, 
I looked in the refrigerator. You don't have any milk. And he said, yes, of course. They are. And I'm thinking, that's a shelf. <laughs> OK? It's like that with our clients. So we have an ongoing process of learning, questioning, and re-evaluating my worldview. I have done so much work with Vietnamese people that I thought just finding a lovely photograph of rice, oh, hang on, I've forgotten, um, would be really easy. So I found a photograph of rice for the Vietnamese word. Hmm, I forgot. Um, but I put it into the information that I had for our cards for the children. And we were just about to print it. Here we go. We we're just about to print it. And so the families could cut it up. And my colleague from Vietnam was horrified. She said, that's not rice. That's rice. It's cooked rice. That's a completely different word from uncooked rice. You can't have that word. Of course they have so many words for rice in Vietnam. I only have one in Australia. It's like Eskimos and snow. You've heard that word. They have so many words for rice. We don't know what we don't know unless we get out of water. By the way, if you have Vietnamese children, these cards are free to download from our website. I'll show you in a minute. So, then you need to learn about the child and their family. You need to learn about the languages, dialects and culture, the children's and family's strengths, their motivations, their aspirations, their environment, and what support is around. How does that family structure work? Who is there? Is it the aunt um, in some of the Pacific island cultures like Fiji and Tonga and countries like that? It's the mother's sister who is the strongest, most powerful in the family. She makes decisions. Okay? So many cultures and families have different ways of doing it. Something that I learned about Vietnamese is that the North and the South have very different pronunciation of consonants. And so I didn't realise that. So I'm happily preparing all my materials for giving a lecture in Vietnam. I was completely wrong because the consonants are so different that if you say vegetable, it could be zao. Rao or yao. Z, d, r, y are different dialects. Who knew? Hopefully, because I know how strong linguistics and phonetics are um, for you, you will all have downloaded the IPA chart and have it on your notice board <coughs> already. There is, uh, our colleagues in Scotland have developed an excellent website called the Seeing Speech website where every element of the International Phonetic Alphabet, you can click on it and hear it, you can see MRI, ultrasound, all different images of that sound being produced. The next thing you need to do is to identify which phonemes are shared and not shared, which are unique to that language. Think about then which consonants may be difficult for you to hear and transcribe. There are consonants in Portuguese, some of the fricatives that I think, my ear doesn't quite hear them correctly and I try and try and try I know they're a bit different. So if I was transcribing Portuguese with a child, I would need somebody to help me with those consonants. But if the child said mm, like M for mum, I'd be pretty good at that one. Do you agree? Don't you teach, you teach phonetic technology? So 
We've done some research um, with students and speech language therapists to see, with monolingual English ones like me, to see which consonants are easy and hard. We have very good ears as speech therapists, so we're quite good. But there are some that we need help with. Some that we do okay. So we've been doing research to learn that. The other thing that I have been working on is I am editing the Oxford Handbook of Speech Development in Languages of the World. And put a little wave if you are an author in this book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have 80 chapters, which consists of about 50 languages and 27 dialects. So there's, of course, Brazilian and European Portuguese in it. There's five or six different Spanish dialects. There's five Arabic dialects, three French dialects, so that you can have a look at the research that's being done in different parts of the world, how children learn to speak. I've been working with 216 authors, and I, in the next few months, will submit it to Oxford University Press. Here are the languages and dialects. Just move away. And, of course, Portuguese. <laughs> It's highlighted in yellow. So it's been an exciting endeavour and I have been learning, learning, learning a lot. This is another brand new thing that we are telling people for the first time today. I want everybody to scan that QR code because it's our new YouTube channel and there's a really cool uh, video from Portugal. <laughs> by some famous superstars in it, but also in many different languages. Hang on, I'll get it out of the way. OK. So what I have asked people to do, I asked Oxford University Press for permission to make the book free. I can't make the book free. <laughs> I can't make the book free, but I can make the contents free. So what has happened is we have been able to create a summary PowerPoint of each chapter in the book. Well, we, I, the authors, have created the summary PowerPoint. They've created it in English plus their language that they speak. So the PowerPoint is Two versions, one in English and one in, I don't know, Turkish or in Swedish or in Putongwa, which is Mandarin, or in Jamaican Creole or in Flemish. There's currently 33 videos. It will, so it's still a work in progress, okay? You are getting a sneak peek before it's ready. But it's awesome. The people have then presented their work in English and also in their own language, so that you can share that with others and say, you know, this is the sort of thing I'm thinking about. But you can also see how remarkable it is um, and also see a professional linguist or speech language therapist speaking in that language. So if you haven't listened to Icelandic recently, Thora Mastotir will speak to you in Icelandic and you can hear what it sounds like. So it's a really exciting endeavour. Thank you. So the other thing we need to do to prepare is to identify assessments in every language. And so I have been collecting speech assessments in every language of the world in, on my website. So you can click and find either how to purchase it or download it for, for free. Um, I do this. You know, there are good ones, there are bad ones, everything is up there. It's up to you to work it out. Um, and I certainly, um, I go and buy things, don't I? I just bought some tests just then <laughs> to add and think about it. The intelligibility and context scale is another assessment that um, our team have developed and it's now available in 60 languages. And we have found out that if children are four to five years of age, then they can, um, they're intelligible, and that is across, we've done it in about 
18 different languages now, and it's the same. Then you need to create a multi-column score form. And instead of just having the standard production and the child's production, we also get the adult in their family to produce the word so that we take account of the dialect of that family member. And so we compare the child's um, production with not only the standard pronunciation, but also the adult in their family. Then we go through and use a traffic light system. Kate has called it the transcription traffic lights. And so there are some consonants that are going to be easy to transcribe, some that are moderately difficult and some that are difficult to transcribe. Particularly in Asian languages, it's the aspiration, how much, how much air. Because in, in languages such as Korean, they have three levels of air, three levels of aspiration uh, for a p sound, for example, which I still can't hear very well, so I need somebody to help me with that. Then we need to identify, I've already hinted this, collaborators who speak the child's language and discuss the similarities and differences in the phonology. <coughs> Give that collaborator, whether it's the parent or the, um, the interpreter or a community member, the score, assessment score form. And remember, it doesn't have to be a person in Portugal. It can be someone in another country. You can reach out to somebody in Vietnam, in Fiji. The internet is a very small place, really, to find somebody to help you with this. And then you record that person, hopefully the family member, doing the same test as the child. Remember to listen and not assume you know what they're talking about. We do a lot of other research. A whole other side of my work is with having children talking to us and getting them to draw. And so we need large listening ears. Um, so don't forget to have large listening ears when we're talking with collaborators. During the assessment, it's really important to assess the child in each of the language. You have to learn from the child about their case history, their language history profile, their strengths and concerns. Then assess the child's speech and their intelligibility and make sure you transcribe the video um, or audio file afterwards, which is hard work when you're a busy clinician. But for kids who speak another language, you need to advocate for more time. And our, um, we have some documentation that you can use um, a position paper about working with multilingual children. Also assess all the other things that you assess, like language, or motor, hearing, and stimulability. Make sure, particularly with people who have not come through the Portuguese system, sometimes children can arrive in Australia and have grown up in wartime, and our, our world is like this right now. And sometimes children can have even a cleft palate and nobody has noticed because they've been fleeing from war. So make sure you look in a child's mouth. Make sure you do a full hearing test with children. You don't know what, who they have been to get to you. Then, when the child is speaking, have them ready, especially for listening to the sounds that you know are going to be difficult. You could highlight them, and they put a tick or a cross next to those sounds and say, yep, got that one right. Nope, didn't get that one right, if they think they got that sound right on the score form. So make sure they're ready to help you with the hard sounds that your ears can't hear well because of our perceptual limitations. The final thing is to do the analysis. So compare the child's productions, both with the standard form and also the adult form. And then there are five different types of error that actually there's only one real error, if it's really an error, 
a true error. It could be that they didn't pronounce it the way that you thought because it was a different dialect. It could be that they're still developing, and this is how all children in that language learn. And I also, on my website, I've got a few hundred um, assess, um, um, speech development norms that are out there. It could be that there's cross-linguistic transfer, that when you say that sound in a, that particular language, it always ends up that way, and it just sounds a bit different. And it could be the way that the parents and the family says that word. Calculate the percentage of consonants correct using a standardised a standard and the dialectal form for that adult version. And then what some of you who know me, in fact, I'll just go on to this. I do a lot of work about speech acquisition, right, and speech acquisition norms. The, this tree house is quite famous in the English-speaking world and has changed how many people in America actually assess children and put them in and out of speech therapy. It's encouraged them to see children earlier in speech therapy because of um, pulling together all of the normative data across 27 languages and then across America. So I like speech acquisition information, but I'm going to show you here I've got the words, consider how strictly you adhere to acquisition data. Oh, that's not coming up there. Because for this particular child, you might not want to use it at all. They might be speaking five languages that all interact. They, you know, and that might not be relevant. But, and remember for a diagnosis of speech sound disorder, there should be evidence in all the languages the child speaks not just one language. But we have found across the 27 languages that we have studied in depth with 60,000 children um, in our review, that by four to five years of age, regardless of the language that they speak, children who are monolingual communicators can be understood by everyone, including strangers, can correctly pronounce almost every single consonant, vowel, and tone. And in fact, vowels and tones are usually around about two to three years of age, and can understand and produce sentences, stories, and conversation. So that is what the satchel looks like. Now I'm running out of time. Maybe I'll edge into some of my question time because I want to tell you a little bit about learning from Vietnamese children now and how we apply it. So just quickly, I want to show you some of the things. Here, for those of you who've been to Vietnam, is a beautiful part of Vietnam, and I've been in this part of Vietnam um, where these women, some of them row the boats with their hands and some with their feet. Did you go to the place that you row with your feet? That was really impressive. Vietnam is a gorgeous place with lots of rice paddies. And yes, they do wear those lovely Vietnamese hats um, and they ride a lot of bicycles and motorbikes. But this is also Vietnam. Vietnam also looks like this. It's a very modern, up-to-date country as well. And many people um, have traveled from Vietnam because of the war in the 1970s and so in Australia, they are often called the boat people because they travelled to Australia. Let me show you and remind you, Vietnam is there, Australia is there, and so they fled from the war by boat. But also, now they're called plane people, aeroplane people, because they fly to Australia for educational opportunities and so forth. It's harder to learn to speak English in Vietnam, so the children arrive with excellent Vietnamese, and they're learning English. There's not a lot of speech therapy in Vietnam. We have helped establish it. So one of the things that we did was develop the Viet speech um, assessment with the Australian government. And this QR code takes you to these cards. There's quite a lot. And also other resources that we've developed to encourage families to maintain their home language and learn about Vietnamese. But the way that we've done the books for the families is that we have one side is English and one side is Vietnamese, so that if you'd like to 
create a Portuguese one, you can just translate the English and have the Portuguese side. So I'm happy to work with people about this. Now here are my superheroes who've helped me. And these are just the ones whose parents said that I could show their pictures around the world. We undertook most of this research during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we posted all of our little superheroes a cake in the mail and said, now, just let me know if this is going to interrupt my microphone. Where did the microphone go? Hang on, fix the microphone. Sorry about that, people who are listening online. OK, here we go. Um, so we got the children in their homes during COVID-19 lockdown. We were going to do it face to face, but you know what it was like, um, to go get their capes and become superheroes and to learn about both English and Vietnamese together. We sent them books. Do you know this book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar? So this is the Vietnamese one. It's got Vietnamese and English. And so we sent them a whole pack of books and things to do. So they went to their bag and said, oh, it's Viet speech, super speech time. Got their capes and off we went. You can see they're preschoolers. They're four and five years of age, OK? Very small, uh, with their families. And one of the best things that we learned was that even though it looked like there was a small number of children in the screen, many families said they had like nine people <laughs> also being superheroes on the edges, <laughs> which was an excellent, excellent thing that happened. So. Let's have a think about how the satchel works for Vietnamese. So, in Vietnamese, there are 23 consonants and a lot of dialectal difference. In English, our consonants are fairly standard. Whether you speak American English or English English or Australian English or South African English, the consonants are basically the same except for R. They have no consonant clusters. They have 16 vowels, again, that change, and six tones. Oh, my goodness, tones are difficult in Vietnamese. There's one called a creaky tone, where it's sort of like, uh, like that, that you make. <sighs> I've tried, so I need somebody to help me to know if the tones are right. It's not me that's going to work that out. I just need a friend. So this is part of what we're doing, is you have to collaborate. You have to find your friend for specific tasks. Their syllable shapes are very simple, um, and it's a syllable-timed language. These are the shared and non-shared consonants. Then what we did was we collaborated with actually one of our people on our team ended up being a, a accredited translator, and she was a linguist. And so, and then we had another in Vietnam, um, Dr. Ben Pham and Dr. Um, Van Tran, amazing support, taught us so much. So we really made sure we did the right thing and learned how to listen. We transcribed 154 children and adults speech in Vietnamese and English. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we were very proud of ourselves. It was meant to be more, but oh my goodness, it took a lot more time. Then we assessed the children in all the languages. We compared family um, and, and some of the studies that we've written. We compared grandma, grandpa, mum, brother, and other brother, like five family members across three generations, to look at differences um, and to really understand considered the dialect, and we accepted the dialectal variance as correct. And then also learnt from the family which languages were they proficient in, considering language proficiency. And so what we found was for different words, we would choose in the analysis phase that there were very few incorrect sounds some were because of dialectal variance or developmental processes, cross-linguistic transfer, or that's just the way that their family said that word, which was a little bit unusual, but that's how they said it. We've done analyses where we've compared if we assess the child only in English, 
all the children would be identified with speech sound disorder, but if we assess them in English plus Vietnamese, half of them are identified with speech sound disorder. And then we undertook intervention, as I've talked about already, and taught them a lot about English and Vietnamese. We taught them that multilingualism is a superpower. And one of my favourite quotes that we published in Language, Speech and Hearing Services in schools uh, last year or the year before was one father who said, you taught me how to love my child, how to sit and play and talk in the language that is my heart language. And so it was a very special project that we did. We've learnt so much, but so did the families. Now, to finish, we, some of you may have attended our Early Childhood Voices 2022 conference. It's a completely free conference and you can even attend it right now. Everything is still online for free. But we, oh, and we had um, just about 2,000 registrations from 72 countries uh, with 100 um, free presentations. We are next week going to launch the call for abstracts for our 2024 Early Childhood Voices Conference. So I want you to watch this space. It's going to be held in November and our YouTube <coughs> channel will be finished with more than 50 different languages um, up there ready for you to watch, as well as many other. It's a very interdisciplinary conference with early childhood educators, psychologists, linguists, speech language pathologists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, all coming together to think about empowering the children of the world. So, I end with this. Children are not the people of tomorrow. They're the people of today. They have a right to be taken seriously and to be treated with tenderness and respect. They should be allowed to grow into whoever they were meant to be. The unknown person inside of them is our hope for the future. So thanks very much for inviting me and for listening. And I think I've used up all my uh, talk time. So at afternoon tea, please come and ask me as many questions as you had, but also please use our email addresses to give us some feedback on how to support you, and clearly I need more time to present this, I'm very passionate about it, um, but how to support you, what else do you need to know if a child from Vietnam came to your clinic tomorrow. Thanks very much, everyone.